माइक चेक Check, 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 one, two, three, check, one, two, three, check, 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 one, two, three. Three, four, five. One, two, three. Test one, two. Test one, two. Yes. Test. Test one, two. Test one, two. Yes. Test. Test one, two. Test one, two. Test one two. Test one two. Test one two. Test. Check. Check one two. Check microphone one two. Test one two. Yes. Test one two. Test one two. Test. Test one two. 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 One shot. One shot. Yes. Test one two. So we're doing this. Test one two. Test. Test one two. Test. Check. Check one two. Test one two. Yes. Test. Test one two. Test one two. Test. Test. You know what we can do? Let's just make this one two three. Make this one two three. Mic test 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 one two three. Test mic 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 one two three. Testing mic. Testing mic. Testing mic. Testing mic. One two three. One two three. Three two one. Three two one. Test mic. Test mic. One two three. Test mic. One two three. Test. 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 Test mic one two three. Test mic one two three. Test mic one two three. Mic test one two three. Mic test one two three.
is this one? Chico? 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 One, two, three, mic test one, two, three. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Um, we want to start on time at 11, so I'm gently requesting that everybody take their seats. Um, persons who are sitting on the panel, please come to the stage and take your seat. Thank you. Test. Yes. Test, can you hear me? Yeah. Can interpreters hear me? Moti, can you hear me? Can you hear me online? We're good? Okay. So they'll give one, one for the ashes. So so the others. How many are you giving them? Okay, so the ashes would to your phone. Oh. <laughs> Test. Okay, I need to test. Test one two. Test one two. Can you hear me? Media? Am I online? Yes? That one has not sat down yet. Even that one that has not sat down. Good morning. Good morning. Bonjour. Bien reposé. Bienvenue au Nadis. Good morning. Test. Clear me. I'm clear. 
Another good morning. Man, you can't get tired of my voice. Thank you. Almost done. For you, sir. Jean de Dieu. Zacharias. I'm good. This is for interpretation. Is it good? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, can I put it down? Last. Almost last. All good? Testing, testing. And final mic. Final mic. Okay.
roles and responsibilities of actors like government and the private sector. I'm going to start with Ms. Paula Inabre. Okay, we're going to move on and come back to that question. Mr. Paul your comments. Okay. Okay, thank you very much to Mrs. Scully. As I did mention earlier, we are trying to keep the time tight to make sure that everyone gets a chance. I'm going to come back to Ms. Paula Inabir, Minister of Information and Communication for Technology for Rwanda.
Thank you very much. I now invite Mr. Lee, the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, I believe he's going to come to the podium to also respond to the question. I had a prepared a statement, but just let me go to straightforward to those uh, uh, the key uh, elements I would like to share with the all participants. Uh, to this um, annual session uh, for the IGF um, from UN DESA, uh, we believe uh, several things we can do. Number one, let me see. Uh, we need to acknowledge that the road of this forum, IGF, as a network of networks. Over the years, IGF community has exchanged an expert experience and good practices and explored the policy solutions for connecting the unconnected. So the IGF has more than 150 national, regional, and youth initiatives. More than 45% of these are in the global south contributing to the capacity building and the knowledge sharing in the internet governance. The IGF collaboration with the schools and on the internet governance also contributes to the institutional and the individual capacity development. The IGF can also accelerate the universal connectivity by creating new partnerships and by generating new ideas. Second, Moving beyond our support to the IGF, UN DESA connects the multi-stakeholder discussions to multilateral approaches on science, technology, and innovation. The reach outcomes of the IGF the annual meetings, for example, are brought to the UN high-level political forum supporting the implementation of the SDGs. The high-level political forum is a critical platform to be leveraged by IGF. Every year since 2015, the nations have come together in New York to, to evaluate their efforts to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and SDGs in the high-level political forum. In this most recent ministerial declaration, the member states of the UN called for the action on several fronts relevant to the, our discussion today, including promoting digital technologies connectivity and access to broadband internet connectivity. Second, to advance the digital inclusion and the literacy and incorporating digital com competences into the education system. Last but not least, enhancing and developing digital skills and the competences. UN DESA also supports the integration of the IGF activities with the work of the technology facilitation mechanism, which has engaged with thousands of scientific and technological stakeholders since its launch and its science and technology and innovation forum. Thirdly, our research on the e-government is a valuable resource. We analyze how public administration uses the internet and digital technology to deliver services to the people. We recently launched the UN e-government survey 2022, the, f the future of the digital governance. The 2022 survey found that digital technologies were central to the how the governments addressed and continue to address the COVID-19 pandemic. The 2022 survey, which is the 12th edition of its publication, also calls on the government to strategize and invest more in long-term national digital transformation. So, distinguished participants, advances in technology must ultimately serve the wider growth of supporting sustainable development and leaving no one behind. This is our goal. This is our expectation from this IGF. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. I'm now going to ask Mr. Antonio Pedro to also answer that question, and I'm going to repeat it. How can multi-stakeholder partnerships contribute to universal, affordable, and meaningful connectivity? And how do you see the respective roles and responsibilities of actors like governments and the private sector? Hello. It's on? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good, good morning. Good, good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, welcome to ECA. Very pleased, very, very pleased to be standing here today and doing a couple of days of this IGF. The excuses, I'm, I'm just coming from uh, uh, the African Union uh, Federal Summit of Heads of State and Government, uh, which was held in uh, Niger and Yemen, so I arrived yesterday. And uh, it sends a very clear signal. First, it recognized that uh, and this, this extraordinary summit was on sustainable industrialization and economic diversification in Africa that have been identified by all of the heads of state and government as a pathway for Africa to claim Agenda 2030 and Agenda 2063. But in doing so, they recognized that digital transformation is key to achieving those goals. And that's important. It sends a very clear signal. So, and we recognize also that achieving that requires the contribution of all the stakeholders that have mentioned earlier by the previous speakers. So, we as ECA, therefore, we use our uh, three functions, the convening, the think tanking, and the operational or advisory services to supporting, first, demystifying uh, the conversations about uh, internet and, and its role in society. And that's important. It simplifies uh, the, 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 the conversations. We also um, identify the opportunities for uh, all the stakeholders to participate. For example, uh, we are supporting our member states to formulate national African continental free trade aid strategies. As you know, the AFCSTA is deemed as the uh, uh, Africa's Marshall Plan. Um, it will create an, uh, a market of 1.5 billion people uh, where with no tariffs uh, and other barriers, this will enable the emergence of uh, 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 small and medium enterprises, regional value chains, which require uh, digital uh, uh, as a means to uh, enabling trade and so on and so forth. That's important. So understanding what the opportunities are, providing that information uh, freely and available to all the stakeholders so that they can invest. And then, of course, supporting with harmonization of legal uh, rules and regulation. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, morning, everyone. M Madam Chair, was that part of my two minutes? <laughs> I hope not. Uh, good okay, good. I'm, I'm, I'll probably take less time than that. So good morning, everyone. My name is Kodjo Bwacha. I'm Vice President of Public Policy for Africa, Middle East, and Turkey. First of all, huge thanks to those who, like Ryan, who I met this morning, who have helped put together this event. And an admission from me, this is my first IGF despite working in this sector for 20 years. So I'm incredibly excited. I think the question of the importance of multi-stakeholder partnerships has partly been answered by certainly a friend and colleague, uh, Honorable uh, Paula uh, and uh, Mr. Scully. Um, and, and by the presence in this room, I think we're all convinced of the importance of multi-stakeholder partnerships, whether that's in setting goals, as we've seen with the Sustainable Development Goal, 9C. I know a lot of people will argue it should be more explicit. Um, any of the ITU goals or that we've set as well, I think, it speak to the importance of multi-stakeholder partnerships, as well as the development of policy and regulation that we've seen come out of organizations like the, the ITU. So I think that question is well answered. I think the question about the role of, of stakeholders is, is possibly more nuanced as I thought about it. So I think generally we speak to governments creating 
the policy and regulatory framework for us to go and use, um, for, for private sector companies to go and use. Civil society organizations being, in some ways, watchdogs, but also being those who inform regions or parts of, the, of where we should go to, as well as the goals as well. And then the private sector should go and invest. And I think it's often more nuanced than that. I, I do think those, those um, uh, roles are important and necessary, and that's what happens, but sometimes more nuanced. So the, private, the, the, the government should certainly set the agenda, should set policy and regulatory environments that are conducive to investment, are conducive to increased uh, access and affordability. But at the same time, sometimes governments have to fill the gaps. When we have access gaps, that's, uh, the governments need to step in. And that's why we have things like universal service funds. Is that the two minutes? So can... So can I take 15 seconds? Okay, I'll take an extra 10. When, when done well, that's why you get great projects like To Africa, which is Meta's project with seven other partners, the first submarine cable to connect east to west or west to east, hitting or connecting 33 countries across Africa, Middle East, Asia, um, and you, uh, it will bring more capacity than all the cables at this point in time. And my view is each of us should know those roles and execute those roles excellently to see projects like that. Apologies, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I'm Director Let's try this one. Thank you. Uh, Director General of Etno, representing Telcos of Europe and also sitting in the newly constituted IGF leadership panel. Uh, we all know connectivity is extremely important and it's vital for all of us, there's no way around this. But connectivity is expensive as we just heard, we need investments and the deployment of 5G and fiber is an extremely capex extensive uh, activity in the industry. So we need the cooperation of governments, public funds, private sector, deployers of connectivity, and it's essential to make sure that the funding and the infrastructure rollout is going exactly to those places and communities which need it. So governments can help in making rollout easier and point to the places where it's needed, but industry can also help community-led out uh, infrastructure. I think these are uh, important, but we also need that investors needs clarity and certainty that they're making a good investment. So connectivity needs to be meaningful and affordable as we talked about, but we cannot risk undue government interference. We cannot risk the uh, network shutdown. We cannot have top-down mandating of standards and protocols. And Edno and our members are a strong support of an open internet and we reject any uh, attempts to fragment the internet using top-down protocols. This is bad for democracy, it's bad for investment, and it's also bad for achieving universal connectivity. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just use this one. Um, thanks very much, Madam Moderator. Africa is the uh, youngest internet region and has known challenges in several areas, uh, from stable connectivity, lack of devices, capacity, content application, uh, education, and new entrants, and quite often insufficient multi-stakeholder community engagement. And uh, if you think these are many, just imagine what they were roughly 30 years ago when our internet was arriving. As there are no uh, you know, technologies for addressing some of these challenges, I would rather focus on a new issue, and which is uh, technology security as in similar to food security. As internet penetration crosses 50%, 
Instead of internet shutdowns, we should be seeking continuous internet. Referring to the second specific objective of the AU Digital Transformation Strategy for Africa, which aspires that by 2030, all access devices are manufactured in Africa, and 30% of information resources and services are developed and hosted in Africa. With that in mind, we must begin to address the risks associated with the dependence on digital technologies and prepare how to maintain continuity. Now, a good amount of technical handicaps in Africa's internet operations are undertaken in projects with global partners. While we understand urgency to complete a checklist, be aware that to acquire capacity to control networks is to do more of the technical networks ourselves. In the 90s, the majority of connectivity providers on the continent were indigenous ISPs, but that is no more. What policy lessons have we learned? Thank you. Thank you Thank you very much. Good morning all. In two minutes, certainly the cost of infrastructure deployment is a factor that uh, affects affordability. The cost of regulating that uh, infrastructure and those markets, especially if it is poor regulation, drives up the cost. The cost for certainly for small island developing states, um, isolated in some cases, the cost of subsea fiber connectivity, the cost of capital to fund this infrastructure is important. And we have to talk about partnerships with international financial institutions like the World Bank, uh, Inter-American Development Bank, and others that can provide cheaper capital to invest. Um, there's also issues with well, the regulation, the cost of infrastructure, and also the deployment, the technology behind it. And we're seeing uh, new advances and things like open radio access networks that allows for the sharing of infrastructure that drives down the cost as well to consumers. So the ability to use new technologies, to use the new technologies that are coming on board, like Leo satellites and 5G in a properly regulated environment and where we can cooperate across regions to on things like harmonization of regulations and policy and spectrum allocation that will help to drive down the cost. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, His Excellency, Mr. Balcha Reba, Director General of the Ethiopian Communication Authority here in our host country of Ethiopia. Your answer.
Thank you, uh, my dear moderator. Uh, good morning, um, everyone. Um, I, I think I would like to address this question in, in relation to the uh, 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 specifically in um, rural areas. The global digital divide is often used uh, uh, to describe the digital gap between uh, the developed and uh, developing countries or um, uh, less developed countries. However, um, when we take it as a national context, it is between the urban and um, uh, rural. Uh, another reason for this uh, urban rural uh, divide is that uh, rural uh, communities struggle to maintain uh, the place at which digital connectivity uh, uh, grows. Internet and urban infrastructure are hard to penetrate uh, in this community. Uh, the availability of power and energy is also uh, 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 a problem. As we know, one of the main challenges uh, or barriers for people uh, to go online is uh, affordability. This is um, in both service cost as well as uh, the cost of uh, acquisition for uh, um, uh, 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 devices. Uh, other challenges include lack of uh, digital literacy. Most people in the rural community are not uh, educated or lack required level of uh, digital uh, skill uh, and find it hard to use uh, digital products um, uh, and services. Uh, since I indicated uh, by um, uh, a panelist um, who spoke um, ahead of me, uh, the um, local content uh, is also uh, one of the problem, uh, like uh, the language barriers, um, and also the localization aspect is also a challenge for the uh, meaningful connectivity. Uh, in general, meaningful connectivity depends on several factors. Uh, which can be considered as uh, connectivity uh, enablers, that is infrastructure, affordability, device, digital skills, um, and local and relevant content. These are crucial factors that affect meaningful, meaningful connectivity, especially in rural areas. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Onika Makwakwa. I'm the head of Africa. It's the recently launched Global Digital Inclusion uh, Partnership. Our team developed a rural broadband uh, policy framework, and the motivation for this was precisely because policy and regulation are seldom uh, focused on the realities of rural and remote areas. This framework uh, is a policy guide that uh, is a guide that uh, provides uh, guidance for actions that will support affordable and meaningful connectivity in these specific areas. Actions um, that are recommended need to include, for example, clear and time-bound targets to affordable and meaningful connectivity with minimum data, a, a speed, appropriate uh, device, and frequency of access uh, for users, specifically for the rural area. Uh, and here it becomes even more important to also include gender targets, because if we don't have these targets, we will not close this gap uh, on its own. It, it will not happen naturally. So it's important to have time-bound targets for how we are addressing the digital gender gap that we heard about uh, at the opening of this session. We have examples of this uh, type of framework already in place uh, in countries such as Benin, as well as the Dominican Republic. It is also uh, recommended within this uh, framework that we look at unlicensed and low-cost spectrum for community-based connectivity solutions to thrive, accompanied with open access solutions to infrastructure networks. There is a lot of examples and a lot of sessions, I believe, happening also within this IGF that will look at how rural areas uh, through community networks and other uh, technologies are actually taking advantage of uh, looking at different technology models as well as different financial models to close these gaps and make sure that people in the rural areas also have affordable and meaningful connectivity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
you very much. Uh, firstly, before I make a few remarks, uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the host country, Ethiopia, Ethiopia and of course the minister, um, Mr. His Hon Honorable uh, Berlete Mola Ketahun, who is uh, present with us here, and of course the State Minister, Huria Ali Mahdi. Thank you very much for the kind welcome and hospitality so far. Uh, this is our first time to travel to Addis Ababa. We are a country that is very far from here. It's about seven hours time difference. And it's exciting for us to come and uh, be part of this very important uh, occasion. And of course, here, you know, very uh, knowledgeable people in this, in this sector. Um, just as a way of uh, saying a few things about what we are progressing in Papua New Guinea, I want to thank the IGF for facilitating a platform for all regions and citizens to have access to internet, ensure, ensuring that no one is left behind. Yeah, in a short space of time, my country, Papua New Guinea, has gained much needed traction in its digital transformation journey, and we acknowledge that internet remains a crucial and a critical enabler for digital transformation. And, and so um, we are happy to be here for this uh, very important uh, uh, meeting. Uh, this year, we have shifted uh, our focus back to our broader infrastructure planning to address the broader goals of accessibility, affordability, and reliability. Realigning our national broadband plan and universal access policy and consequently We'll be making amendment to our National ICT Act of 2009 in our effort to bring internet connectivity to all, all, uh, all the citizens of our country. Uh, in early September, I had the opportunity to attend the regional IGF meeting in Singapore, and uh, I met a uh, lot of uh, very interesting people. And of course, uh, Madam, if you can just give me a little bit of uh, time, I'm from a very far country, so <laughs> why not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, last week, my ministry with our Department of ICT uh, and Regulator finalized our national broadband plan um, at a stakeholder workshop. And this is uh, basically, uh, internet is new to my country and, of course, to, uh, to our region. And what we are doing right now is trying to uh, involve our stakeholders and our people to migrate into that uh, area in technology so that uh, we can catch up on uh, what, it, what the world is doing right now. So it's very interesting, but uh, maybe I can have some more time later. Thank you, Thank you very much. Does this work? Someone is nodding, so thank you very much. First of all, a pleasure to be here on this esteemed panel. So. I work for ICANN, and um, just to explain what we do, every time you go online, you hit about something that actually originates from us and our team. I haven't had breakfast, so that will work. Thank you. Is it better now? Anyway, every time you go online, you hit about something that originates from ICANN and our technical partners. Together, we provide the three building blocks of the internet, the IP addresses, the DNS, and the IP protocols. Today we have more than 5 billion users using those three building blocks, which is a fantastic number, which we never had estimated. That is what actually creates, technically, the interoperable, the open internet, that everybody uses the same system. But internet is not done. It's fair to say that when it was invented and started, it was done for a Latin script and English language. One of the big challenges we have right now is to make sure that anyone who goes online, the next billion users, can use their own language, their own script. They don't have to read from left to right. They don't know how to know what a dot is. And this is one of the important things for us from the technical community to work, for, for instance, with governments to make sure that when in procurement, you put in demands of what we call universal acceptance, which is basically to promote your own language. That's another thing we are doing right now, which is important to us, is that everybody on this panel agrees that, especially for Africa, we have to think differently. We have to do it in a different way. The ordinary business models, the ordinary way of doing things will not work. So on Thursday, ICANN is launching something we call the Coalition for Digital Africa. And whereas we invite other partners to work with us from a technical community and really be a building block to rethink how we do things together. ICANN 
as a pledge for that, we already made our first investment here in Africa to do that, which we did and launched in Kenya two weeks ago, where we built the first called cluster, root server cluster in Kenya. That has the effect that we saw immediately that before that, about 40% of all queries, all internet traffic actually went to Europe. Now it's less than 10%. We saw an immediate effect on that investment. What means that people in Africa who access the internet now has a faster internet and more secure internet. And talking about investment plans, we charge nothing to do that. So going forward, I think that we have to come back to the important thing of rethinking things. Another example of that is that ICANN, for the first time, made a pledge to the I2D to work together with partners to promote something we think is very important. Local country code. Thank you. Great. Uh, this is where clear gender specific and geographical uh, specific targets and programs uh, come in. The Universal Service and Access Funds and other private, uh, public and private uh, initiatives uh, come in uh, to play a critical role here in helping us close uh, these di divides and making sure that those who are historically disadvantaged are not once again left behind on these uh, digital developments. USFs should be used uh, to their fullest extent, and in the case of gender, 50% of the resources should indeed be used to ensure women and girls' participation, uh, and that they actually are not just participating, but they are meaningfully uh, connected uh, to digital opportunities. Our team did a study of the, uh, with the U UN Women of the Universal Service and Access Funds, and we found that for the most part, uh, these funds uh, were existing, but were largely not used for what they were meant for. We cannot accept that, and these are important mechanisms uh, to be supported to make sure that we are more efficient and we set the targets to close the di digital uh, divides that exist at the moment. Thank you.
Thank you. I think many of the, the questions have been answered by, by... One thing I always think about when this question comes up, and I think that, again, coming back to what we... The, if we talk about Africa as a continent and all the countries in here, I think it's important to realize that from, coming from organizations mind, we're here to help, we're here to serve. We're not here to define the problems or come up with the solutions to the problems. Because the, the, in this specific continent, like anywhere else, there's sort of a reinventing of how things are done. To, to bring out an equal and interoperable internet in the rest of the world was much easier to do it here. And that's why we try to work with our partners here to really understand the problem, but the solutions has to come from this region. It has to be, Internet for Africa has to come from Africans rather than from other organizations as well. When it comes to the uh, equality and get people online, I think in a way the internet is itself is one of the both built equalizers. I often speak about when I was in Latin America many years ago, when I asked the question, so why is it important to get people online? And I was expecting the answer that it's so important for people for unemployment and stuff. But they said something is that if you peep, get people online, you take away one of the biggest disadvantages that exist for, for poor people, access to information. Access to information has always been a rich man's right. If you get people online, if you get people online so they can go to a diverse internet, you will actually help them a lot by making sure that they have access to the same information. So internet itself, I think, is an equalizer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. your response. Thank you. I would like to build on the previous comments about the importance of building uh, local content and solutions. 
We are particularly proud of our program, Connected African Girls Initiative. These are coding camps that uh, we're bringing young girls and women uh, to uh, learn uh, all sorts of skills from uh, machine learning to artificial intelligence. So far, we've trained about 25,000 uh, young girls and women across, across Africa, um, uh, growing. So this, again, is very important. In addition to that, uh, we've equally uh, opened recently an African Regional uh, Center of Excellence for Artificial Intelligence uh, in Congo, Brazzaville, again, enabling uh, young girls and women and, and boys uh, to have access to uh, this, this uh, um, opportunity. Um, so again, building infrastructure to support uh, increased uh, uh, internet penetration on the continent. We're very proud of our uh, African Regional Center for Cybersecurity that's going to be established in Togo. Um, again, with the same principle, making this uh, uh, an, an, an opportunity for everyone, uh, uh, elucidating what are the, the opportunities. So uh, earlier I, I was talking about the infrastructure. So as you know, the African Union has the uh, digital uh, strategy, uh, tra digital transformation strategy for Africa. So we are supporting at the country level to formulate national uh, digital transformation strategy. This is very important so that we can identify what are the key issues and problems at the country level so that uh, the national solutions and uh, specific solutions that were Paul made reference to earlier can, can become a, a reality. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Moderator. Um, to improve basic connectivity um, uh, to the level of uh, affordable um, and uh, 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 meaningful uh, connectivity, um, uh, in my opinion, you know, policymakers um, uh, and the regulators uh, and other stakeholders um, can intervene using tools or uh, levers uh, that can. Um, uh, uh, encourage uh, the investment uh, policy uh, and uh, regulatory uh, programs, um, one of which is uh, introducing a competition. When we introduce a competition, um, uh, we can achieve uh, the quality of service, uh, we can achieve uh, the affordability uh, as well as uh, the uh, accessibility and availability of uh, the um, infrastructure. Uh, uh, and also it is uh, good you know, to introduce um, uh, programs uh, like uh, public-private uh, partnership uh, and private sector involvement and increase uh, the coverage of uh, uh, the network. Uh, the other program which can be um, uh, implemented is um, reduce uh, taxes on uh, devices, especially on uh, smartphones, um, and also introduce mechanism like uh, device subsidy, especially uh, for uh, uh, rural areas um, uh, and for uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, not hubs. Uh, and also uh, the implementation of universal service um, uh, and the uh, uh, universal service fund is uh, uh, one of uh, the mechanisms that can be uh, implemented. Uh, and, and the other is uh, to put in place alternative uh, energy source uh, mechanisms. Because in rural areas, we know that you know, um, the energy availability uh, hampers really uh, the connectivity, especially uh, when we consider it as a meaningful uh, connectivity. Um, uh, so uh, all these um, mechanisms, especially in policy area, uh, we can uh, make it uh, inclusive, uh, like to entertain the gender uh, uh, gap addressing, uh, as, as well as uh, also the, uh, uh, the uh, f f accessibility, f yeah, accessibility for people with uh, disabilities. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'm, sli I'm slightly biased because I, I have, I'm going to admit my bias. I've, I think the, the youth and the generation coming are arguably, arguably, not arguably for me, but are going to be the most intelligent, most productive generation there is. And I think that will happen um, whether we train them or not if they have devices. I think access is the most important thing. Having said that, if we want to accelerate that conclusion that I assert, I think we do need to provide uh, training in all these areas. And as Meta, and I'll quickly, because I know two minutes goes quickly, I'll try and speak to some of the training that we've provided uh, across this continent, but also further afield. So first and foremost, Digify Pro, I think we've trained now 200,000 people face to face with instructors. We've reached 4.7 million people through Facebook and Instagram. Trained, it gives people skills to use ICTs, but also trains them in, in a way to use ICTs safely, respectfully, um, and to drive equity in many, many ways. I think we can speak to our boost with business, and I see so many government stakeholders in the, in the um, uh, uh, auditorium who have benefited and their people have benefited from boost with business. So we've trained 300,000 people face-to-face -face with boost with business and probably reached about 3.8 million people using those sorts of programs. It's essential that companies like Meta do this sort of training, but I think what's more important is that we give young people, again, who will be the most productive, most intelligent generation that we have, the, the, the devices and the access to, to, to forge their own path as well, and to undertake that training. That's two minutes and one second, Madam Chair. Do I get, a, do I get an applause this time? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, we all agree, I believe, that digital skill is uh, a component of meaningful connectivity. And it's not only skills on how to use and, and benefit from the internet, but also sk skills about how to code, create, design the internet, because this is our society of tomorrow. Well, in, in Europe, uh, 2023 is the European Year of Skills, and in 2021, the European Commission set digital t decade targets. And why is this important? Because we think this can help driving skills, too. And uh, part of the digital decade targets is skill. So by 2030, the Commission aims to have 20 million ICT specialists in Europe, which is uh, and a much higher proportion of women than today. And we need to have 80% of the population to have ba uh, basic digital skills. So I think targets can help us uh, up skilling and skilling people. And uh, what we see is uh, we can have a teaching of skills in academic institutions that can be supported by public and private funding. But another very important point that we see from the industry is upskilling. We need skilled labor. So we work together with the unions in upskilling people for the future. So one way uh, where a population can have access to skills, upskilling or reskilling, is through multi-stakeholder partnerships, which we see around the world. And this includes the industry that I represent, working together with governments and civil societies. So uh, one final reminder from my side, the climate must be right, not only on the investment, but we need an open global uh, internet based on international standards and governed in the bottom-up way. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. And we had a slight technical challenge there, so we've swapped out the mic. I'm going to ask Mr. Nee Quenar to answer the question. Thanks, Madam Moderator. Well, as a teacher, I say to the youth, go to school, get skills, be entrepreneurial, and live on the internet. In the technical space, the African Internet Technical Institutions, AFSTAR, will be there to help you keep up with the skills. Seems widely accepted that quality broadband connectivity contributes to GDP. Thus, what the broadband is used for would contribute differently to GDP. Hence, what skills, what importantly, education, may be a major factor in meaningful connectivity. We should develop technical skills, and partners should urge we do the technical work to acquire the skills to prevent inadvertently outsourcing technical capacities, especially around the name services CCTLDs and DNSSEC. By taking the ready way, we fail to develop our technical capacity. We should be cautious because there are some operational decisions which are difficult to reverse. There's a long cycle of science and technology research preceding commercial products of the internet. We need to ensure our educational and research institutions are abreast and plugged into the global research activities and are resourced to contribute. As we accomplish our goals on access, the differentiation among economies will be the quality of the education and research in the disciplines leading to the technologies. This will require we upgrade academic curriculums and labs to be more internet or network friendly and pursue science and technology geared towards local problems. We promote the national research and education networks as a means of providing connectivity to education and research institutions, including schools. Keep it together and share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Quenar. I now ask Mr. Rodney Taylor to respond to the question. Thank you very much, Joel. I'll just, since examples have been, well, the answer question has been answered, so I'll just give an example from the Caribbean, where I'm from, in particular Barbados, a project I was involved in called Digital Ambassadors. And what it was, was that uh, education is free at the point of delivery up to tertiary education, but those students in particular who are doing computer studies are required to give back some time to the communities, in particular when governments, uh, when the government launches a digital service, a new digital service, they are part of the uh, development cycle, they're part of the user acceptance testing, and they are received training first. And they are then deployed in community centers and schools and bring the, uh, the older generation on board, they focus on persons with disabilities and marginalized groups. 
So I think that's an excellent initiative to mainstream young people as part of the whole digital transformation initiative. Then they have the capacity and the natural affinity to go and train uh, the wider community and raise the level of digital skills across the board in society. Of course, there are other initi initiatives. ITU has excellent uh, online courses through the ITU Academy. Um, we have Girls in ICT as well, a good initiative to ensure that women are included. Um, Cisco has Girls Power Tech, which we've used in the Caribbean. There's Caribbean Girls Hack as well. And these initiatives that help to mainstream women and young people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Excellency Misu. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, uh, Madam Moderator. The uh, question on um, digital skills is extremely important and one uh, we in my country are grappling with ourselves. We are working hard to improve digital skills for our students, government workers, and our small and uh, medium en enterprises also. We are working with our national education department and our universities to upgrade the curriculum in schools and embed digital ICT literacy in the curriculums. Our plan is to work closely with the youth, primary and secondary students, and conduct training for them, and the students will then educate their parents on digital and ICT literacy, because it's a new wave of technology for us in the country, and uh, we are trying our very best not to leave any, any person behind. We will encourage the industry and our partners to support digital literacy for our farmers and SMEs as well. So um, um, we are working to build ICT labs in many of our schools and community centers. Just recently, I opened two uh, ICT labs in a, in, a, in a secondary school and in a community. And that includes um, uh, youths, girls, persons with disabilities, and others who can experiment with uh, these new technologies. So we also having several uh, awareness activities all through our country to educate people on digital skills. Like when the internet came, uh, arrived in our country not so long ago, it's, it's taken the country by storm and many of our people do not know how to use and they are illiterate in the usage of um, literacy in, in many of the parts of the country and, and, and thus making them uh, misuse uh, internets and, and, and of course the uh, social media and all that uh, on, 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 the, um, on the net. So um, we are working very closely with those in the industry to help create some training programs. In the past month, we have signed an MOU with one of our national universities to host a program, and we are also working with the PNG Computer Society and the PNG Digital uh, ICT clusters on other digital literacy projects. So. Um, I'm happy also that we have signed an MOU with EPINIC, and I'm also happy that Cisco is, has been, is, we, we have an, an agreement with Cisco. And okay, I can, thank you, Excellency. On, on I'm going to have to wrap you. you up there. Thank you very much. And I come now to Doreen Bogdan Martin and for her response to the question.
Thank you very much. We will now move on to the next question, looking forward to the future of a post-COVID world. What lessons can we retain from the pandemic about digital infrastructures that are meaningful to human development? And just giving you a little bit of the situation that Barbados found itself in, where we have almost 80% penetration. But yet, when the pandemic hit and we went on lockdown and you found you had online school, we found that we may have had the access, but not the device by which to access. So you may have a situation where you have a home that has three children, two parents, the three kids are different ages, in different levels of school, the parents, maybe one is working from home, but there's one laptop or one phone. So while I'm liking this, the way that we're framing the conversation is one of the digital in infrastructures access to affordable devices. And I'm going to start with you, Mr. Pedro. Thank, thank you very much. So um, COVID-19 is, is, was, of course, challenging for everyone, including in Africa. It accentuated the digital divide, uh, which you referred to earlier. Uh, not only uh, between the north and south, but within countries themselves, in the urban-rural divide. But it equally provided, um, it demonstrated the value proposition of, of digital transformation, in the sense that uh, we've, uh, uh, we're capable of, prov of uh, uh, putting forward or, or bringing innovative solutions to some of our problems, from e-procurement uh, that facilitated, for example, uh, access to uh, goods and services to Africa. I mean, for example, it's through the platforms that we created uh, from ATEX to AVAT and so on that we enable Africa to have access, for example, to vaccines, to goods and services. So moving forward, and that's, that's where, I mean, uh, here, uh, moderator, I would uh, please plead for you to give me a little bit of more time, where my reference to uh, the uh, African Union Summit of Heads of State and Government is important. Uh, because it's, it's about moving forward. And the summit has recognized, as I started with, that digital is, uh, transformation is key uh, to achieving th those goals. So, uh, and we need to be able to demonstrate that value proposition across several jurisdictions. For example, um, with the studies and evidence that shows that investments in digital transformation will contribute significantly to GDP and so on and so forth. There, you'll have the attention of the ministers of finance who can then deploy uh, resources for us to be able to, to invest in, in, in improving infrastructure, broadband access, and so on and so forth. The countries that we're celebrating today, from Rwanda to many others on the continent, have recognized that importance early uh, uh, in, the, in the development of the digital uh, infrastructure and ecosystems. And they put money there. So we need to invest more into, into that. that that process. For example, in Central Africa, uh, they, I mean, the cost of access to internet is, is prohibitive. And one of our efforts was to really to try and demonstrate by comparing what Central Africa was not doing and what East Africa was doing when they established in one network area. And what the, the, the advantage it creates in terms of facilitating business processes and, and uh, inter access to common citizens and so on and so forth. And it was with those numbers that we convinced policymakers in Central Africa to move with the agenda to create a one network in Central Africa. Okay. So this, more, more of these I goes wrap you up there. Thank I you. I'm to wrap you up there. Thank you very much. And now I go to Ms. Paula Inabir.
this guy's content and you're able to generate in an interesting manner. But at the same time, we're also able to make sure that affordability remains uh, uh, possible by managing all the services. So that's what the COVID experience has taught us uh, to really figure out a multi prong approach to delivering meaningful connectivity. Thank you very much, Ms. Enabir. And I now call on Ms. Onika Makwaka for your comments. Thank you, uh, Moderator, for sharing that uh, experience. It actually helps to uh, demonstrate the inequalities that were um, highlighted by our COVID-19 experience. First, um, I think one of the things is that uh, we are at a point post-COVID where digital policies uh, have a much greater understanding and that understanding needs to permeate through across uh, other sectors as well. So it is really important that we collaborate even ever more uh, so now to make sure that uh, we are actually meeting people's needs uh, by making sure that digital policies actually can be worked across all sectors, health, education, uh, et cetera, that uh, can help uh, improve people's lives. Secondly, I think uh, through this discussion, it's quite clear that there is a resource need in order for us to address uh, these uh, inequalities and reach universal access. Uh, a recent uh, documentation by ITU, I believe, pegs it at about $428 billion needed uh, to connect everyone uh, universally. Even if private sector could contribute half of that, we still need governments to come and make commitments, as well as uh, development aid and other sectors to contribute uh, towards closing that gap. And lastly, I would be remiss if I did not mention that COVID-19 also so as uh, we also saw a rise in online gender-based violence that is counterproductive towards our digital inclusion efforts. So it is important that we begin to look at policies to ensure that we minimize, uh, or actually not minimize, we eliminate uh, violence online against women because it is one of the factors that contributes towards the digital gender gap. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lee, you wanted to say a few words? Thank you, um, Madam Moderator. I'm sorry to ask the floor again. That I just want to share the two more pieces of uh, information for the all participants with regard to go beyond um, uh, after all the pandemic. Um, after our IGF next um, September, United Nations is going to host our SDG Summit. I guess um, uh, we will go together um, uh, for the written review for SDG implementation. So it would be a good occasion for us, for all stakeholders, to, to take into account what we need to achieve uh, by <coughs> the SDG. And second, uh, the Secretary General also proposed uh, to launch the Global Digital Compact to be adopted, by, uh, to be adopted in 2024 when the UN is going to host the Summit of the Future. Actually, we have invited the all contributions from the all stakeholders. We hope that we uh, would collect the all contributions from you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I am now going to go to Mr. Quenar, Chairman of Ghana.com. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Um, the internet grows at the edge where we develop benefits from applications that solve our problems. The cracks showed up when during COVID pandemic, we were challenged to use the internet uh, during the lockdowns and the local services were not there, they were not available. We all saw at that time the potential of the domestic internet. The internet had been positioned as though to provide access to international services, to services overseas. Operators took users to international content providers. The internet had not permeated nor been assimilated sufficiently into the domestic economy and the social fabric. The exchange points have worked well for us, but unfortunately, content was not following the exchange points, and in-country links need to become more affordable. 
the infrastructure and arrangements were not prepared for such stress tests. We could not easily take people from homes to offices, nor from homes to schools. We could not acquire the local services we needed online. We need to have a plan for such situations. Online was not yet part of the culture, but is fast becoming so since, post, since COVID. And we shall embrace the various emerging virtual working and meetings innovations in mass so that we can expand our reach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Mr. Paul Scully, your comment? Thank you very much. And uh, you, you're absolutely right to highlight the acceleration that has been caused through COVID, the, the digital infrastructures, and the test of which I think actually the multi-stakeholder framework has um, come out really positively for because you saw so many bodies rising to the challenges of the pandemic, whether it was uh, public authorities providing health care advice and obviously private and public authorities providing education for so many uh, children, children, businesses, businesses and retailers, retailers providing services, services online, online and collaboration, and collaboration between scientists, scientists which uh, resulted in really successful vaccination programs in so many parts of the world. Um, but we've got to make sure that we embed the learning of that and shape the change that is coming. We talked, I heard about hybrid working. We've got to make sure that we all work together to, um, to capture that change. And ICANN uh, underpins so much of that with their work uh, fishing out the bad actors who were um, looking at the, you know, phishing and scams and those kind of things by suspending the main names and, and deleting the main names which um, perpetuated such abuse. But I should just that finally say, conclude by a welcoming the UNIGF in this regard because the, the crucial role that it facilitated discussions um, was, was very positive. Not being a decision-making body allow stakeholders to the freedom to try out, to explore, to debate and discuss um, new policy ideas without being restricted by a binding vote at the end of the annual meeting. But it's important that we work on the technologies as well for young people to be able to access these, and as, you, as you rightly said at the beginning. But that will be to discuss through um, public, government and the private sector and new technologies helping younger people access the digital infrastructure across the world. Thank you very much. And our final question before we wrap up, what measures are currently in place to ensure more affordable, meaningful, and inclusive connectivity in Africa and beyond? And what kind of international framework do we need to complement these and achieve Agenda 2030? I'm gonna start with you, Mr. Taylor. Thank you very much. Uh, I can speak to examples in the Caribbean. A Carib IX is one initiative that um, seeks to deploy internet exchange points, which is a part of the infrastructure as well, to drive more efficient routing of network traffic and reduce the costs. Uh, because uh, local content in particular doesn't need to be transited internationally, and there's a cost to that. Of course, there's a whole ecosystem around IXPs, such as caching and so on, that will help to improve uh, internet access uh, and make it more meaningful, especially if there is local content uh, to, be, to be accessed. In addition, I think that the issue of universal service funds, we've spoken about this before, uh, need to be deployed more effectively. Uh, there's no point in having hundreds of millions of dollars sitting on a bank account uh, when it cannot be used to, to pay for devices and to train and to provide access at community centers and so on. And I think lastly that if we see the issue of uh, connectivity as a universal right, then we ought to approach it as a universal right and seek to have a global digital compact. And I know this is an initiative of the United Nations, a global digital compact that um, provides all the necessary resources, in particular to developing countries, to drive down the cost of uh, connectivity and make it more meaningful with all of the other considerations that we've spoken of today uh, with respect to meaningful and affordable connectivity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Excellency Mesu. Thank you again. Uh, the, the government of Papua New Guinea, through my ministry, and, and of course the Department of ICT and our regulator, NICTA, uh, we worked uh, working very closely to, to uh, close the digital gap and make universal access a reality. 
We are working to ensure that no one is left behind. And, and, and that is why we have added special emphasis and efforts um, geared to ensuring that women, girls, persons with disabilities, indigenous persons are not uh, left out. So um, in, in progressing this last week, we held a stakeholder workshop on our new universal access service policy where we laid out our goals and objectives on connectivity. As we stated at the ITU plenipotentiary and at our broadband plan and UAS stakeholder workshops, it is crucial that women and girls, persons with disabilities, indigenous groups and others are included in this digital economy. It is why we are, uh, we are devoted to a separate focus area on, on, on this, this, this issue. Um, we, we have uh, uh, very important plans that uh, we want to roll out uh, as far as uh, connectivity and accessibility, affordability is concerned. And uh, we don't want to leave our, our neighbors behind like our Pacific uh, brothers and sisters. And, and so we are uh, offering help to our neighbors in the, in the Pacific region okay. as well. Thank Excellency, you I'm going to have to wrap you up there. Thank you very much. Excellency Rebo. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Moderator. Um, uh, uh, regarding the um, uh, what is the current aspect, uh, especially I will, I will try to address this um, in connection to the scenario in our country. Um, the Ethiopian government has launched the homegrown economic uh, reform agenda, one of which is uh, to introduce the digital transformation. Accordingly, uh, we have already adopted the Digital Ethiopia 2025 strategy, uh, and now we are implementing uh, the strategy. In this strategy, uh, one of uh, the major components are uh, like uh, connectivity, uh, universal access uh, and service, uh, digital skills, uh, as well as um, uh, the uh, enablers like the uh, digital ID program, uh, as well as the e-commerce, and um, uh, also encouraging uh, the um, uh, uh, startups um, and so that uh, the ICT ecosystem can develop um, and really encourage the digital um, uh, connectivity uh, in terms of uh, meaningful um, connectivity. Uh, at the same time, we have also developed a separate universal service and uh, access framework, which has six streams. Uh, it ranges uh, from um, addressing the um, access gap, uh, uh, like also fiberization program uh, to really uh, develop the back hole and the backbone. Uh, same time, uh, also to go to the level of uh, developing the uh, applications and the content, as well as also support the digital skill uh, and also the, uh, the... Thank you, Excellency, uh, but I'm going to have to wrap you up there. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Please follow. Thank you. Um, to achieve 2030, the agenda, uh, I think it's an important starting point to bring the diverse elements together, meaning infrastructure, standards, governance, investment, innovation skills, to assure that IGF is fit for purpose going forward. And we heard, we're looking forward to the Summit for Future with the digital, uh, Global Digital Compact, and the new IGF leadership panel is one important part in this international framework. I think a strong uh, measure could be that we could actually set our own truly ambitious international agreed SDGs for the internet in a multi-stakeholder way. We know that digital te technologies relate to many of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but we could use this momentum we have for the summit for the future and the compact to set a series of goals for how we want the internet and the digital economy to look in the next decade. Regions and countries are working on this too, such as EU digital uh, decade, setting objectives for connectivities and skills. And we see the work is going on in the US. And I wish, wish to say one final word on the importance of this process being inclusive. 
we will achieve meaningful and inclusive connectivity only if the governance framework is in fact inclusive. And this means that governance bodies need to look outside the immediate internet community to speak with and engage with those sectors who are building their business on the internet, like banking, like logistics, like healthcare. Okay, Ms. Fra, I'm going to have to wrap you up Okay, there. sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Marby? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always hard to be in the end of something because so many small <laughs> things have been said. But I want to point out really to, to two things, and I want to do a little bit general comment. One of the amazing things when the COVID came around was that you never heard that the internet went down. Uh, we had the biggest internet day ever, uh, November, October, November 2020, with 8.4 billion requests into the system. Today, on an average, we have 8 trillion requests into the systems to provide you with internet. It never went down. You never hear it expressed on the internet where it actually went down. And this is actually because it's a network of networks with many different players, all working according to standards and protocols. And we should not forget, so we can be able to maintain that, Every day, every conversation, there are discussions about doing this differently. And that can actually create a real fragmentation of the internet. And fragmentation of the internet means that you can't connect to the internet at all. You can't have a dual internet, it will always be one internet, and I'm happy to be part of providing that. But I think we shouldn't also forget that internet is local and global at the same time. Often when we talk about the big things everybody does, we talk it from a global scale, but it's very, very, very local. Most of the traffic actually goes between people, individuals in a country, in a region. And I think, looking at Africa, it's so important to build the ecos ecosystems in, that, in your own regions, your own countries, so the traffic, the business ideas, all of these actually stays within the country. And one of the interesting things of that is a project we're doing together under the pledge to the ITUD, that we're trying to mirror uh, the capacity building and training country code operators. Why is that important? One of that I'm going to have to wrap you up the there, Mr. Marby. We're heading for the finish company. line. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Boache, and we are even shorter. We're down to a minute and a half. Uh, uh, a, a minute and a half isn't that much. So <laughs> I, will, I will quickly say on, um, on this question of, uh, Ms. Madam Chair, can you take 10 seconds to remind me of the question? <laughs> Absolutely. What measures are currently in place to ensure more affordable, meaningful, and inclusive connectivity in Africa and beyond? And what kind of international framework do we need to complement these and achieve Agenda 2030? So, great. So I can take 50 seconds. I think most of those frameworks, as we said in the first question, are in place. I think the goals under the SDGs, I think the work of the ITU, I think the work of ICANN that we've heard my colleague on the left speaks so eloquently about, give us enough multi-stakeholder frameworks to, uh, to move forward. Having said that, I do think there is need for reform in a, in a couple of areas. So um, one of the things that we are particularly focused on at Meta, and I know many others are, is spectrum reform. So use of unlicensed spectrum we know can be extremely beneficial, especially in the 51, uh, 57 to 71 gigahertz band. And we're seeing many parts of the world, not so much Africa, and I know many African uh, under, the, under the auspices of the ITU, uh, many African regulators are thinking about it, but we certainly see that. And then the other big thing that we would like to see reform of, or the greater use of, is, is regulatory sandboxes. As a company that's focused on the next computing platform, the metaverse, rather than the internet, as well as the internet, we're starting to push innovation as hard as we can. And in some, inst in some countries, that innovation is being held back by the fact we don't have regulatory frameworks in place to support it. And we've seen the use of regulatory sandboxes uh, uh, um, bring great dividends in that area. So that's the reform. I hope that was 50 seconds or so. <laughs> and you got back your extra 10 seconds that I asked the question. So, so yes. <laughs> and Mr. Scully? Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's not about legislation. It is about frameworks and partnerships. And they already exist, working well with the ICTs who know the importance that they have in helping deliver the SDGs. But we need to build on that framework to make sure that we can have the financial investments for private, private companies, the local expertise of civil society groups, all supporting digital access. And we're working to improve and expand internet connectivity and bridge the digital divide through those public-private par partnerships. But we're also working on the last mile connectivity as well through um, 
uh, projects like the Kenya's National ICT Plan that we're working with on TV white space um, and the National Broadband Plan and right of way regulation in Nigeria. But then we go down to what we were talking about before, about devices, and it's really important that when I was in Kenya four years ago, I'm looking at bridge stalls that were using tablets to deliver education. There's a greater use of the acceleration of the internet when you're actually trying to tackle how to get girls that would have to maybe walk 10K to their schools, how you can better deliver education. All of that will work through frameworks organized by, by the UK government, by other governments, but also organizations like IGF. Thank you very much. And just before we wrap up, I am going to challenge all of you. Show me how good you are. Final comments, 30 seconds. I'm going to start with you, Excellency Masu. 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, we want our people in our rural communities to have means of access uh, government goods and services through mo mobile phones uh, without the expense and wasted time of travel and queues, or have hospitals to be able to register births, uh, clinics and doctors to be able to register health visits or give a co convenient appointment time for children to receive their vaccines, for schools to make registrations, for students to, to be uh, easy and convenient at minimal or zero cost, and without walking for hours or standing Excellency, in long time winding queues. And that's what we want to do uh, in, in the space of internet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Paula Ingeber. I think uh, we've said it all uh, through the different interventions of the panelists. And what is key is that we build the right partnerships that are going to allow us to close on the gaps that we've highlighted, but also at the same time that will allow us to drive impact at scale. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Scully. Thank you. Just want to thank the IGF for bringing us all together for this um, a really important panel. The multi-stakeholder model is absolutely critical for bridging the digital divide. It's important that we all come together in partnership. And I know my colleagues there, I'm sorry I can't be there, but my colleagues will be attending a number of the sessions uh, this week to explore ideas how we can uh, achieve universal, affordable, meaningful digital connectivity. So I wish you an excellent conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellency Reba. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, just I would like to say uh, a few on uh, meaningful uh, connectivity. Uh, meaningful connectivity means it is a, uh, a people's experience. Uh, so it is an experience of unlocking the full power of internet access. Uh, for this to happen, we need uh, high-speed internet, uh, an appropriate device, unlimited broadband connection, uh, and unfragmented use. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you came in just under the radar. 30 seconds. Mr. Lee? Well, much I've said that I just have the two sentences. Partnership among the all multi-stakeholders for IGF. Second, action, action, action. Let's not hold back. Thank you very much. Mr. Pedro? Uh, the world of tomorrow is going to be much more complex that, than the world that we know today. So we need to invest in foresight capabilities, uh, all of those things, and the Internet is at the center of it. So I'm very excited with uh, what is happening now. For example, there is this Zindi, which is a community of 50,000 da data scientists in Africa that are co-creating solutions. We need more of those moving forward because the solutions really require this multi-sectoral analysis and so on and so forth. Thank you. Got to wrap you up there. And Ms. Bogdan Martin. Yes, thank you. Um, so universal, affordable, meaningful, and I would add trusted connectivity is our goal. The ITU Planning Pot declared that, as Minister Timothy noted. Without it, without including the third of humanity that is digitally excluded, we won't achieve the SDGs. And to achieve that universal connectivity, we have to work together, all of us, focused on access, adoption, and value creation to unleash the transformative power of digital for all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Taylor. 
Thank you very much, Joel. And 30 seconds is just enough for me to thank the IGF Secretariat for uh, including us in the discussion and having a diverse panel from various regions. We represent small states in the Caribbean, and if we continue in this spirit of cooperation and inclusiveness, I think we have enough intellect and the enough will to solve this problem of global meaningful connectivity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Quinar. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Well, Africa has come a long way uh, you know, in the past 30 years with internet. Uh, so before we go anywhere, we should look back a little and see what did we do right and what could we improve. Uh, but bear in mind that Africa is very diverse and very large. Uh, and you know, no one size fits all. It will require some patience and some you know, diligence uh, maybe some interlocal uh, engagements as well as interregional uh, solidarity. Okay, and Mr. Quinn, I've got to wrap you up there. Ms. Furth? Thank you. I'm extremely positive for the future. I think we have very interesting uh, work ahead of us. The multi-stakeholder model is essential for this. This panel showed us how many good things are going on out there. But I still believe we need some SDGs for the internet to make uh, the, the work count and have a, a good direction going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In all development, it's important to realize where we come from. The, multi the technical organizations governed by the multi stakeholder model is taking a system that was designed in the 60s to have more than 5 billion users. We've done that in a technical way. We don't interfere in the politics. We don't take sides in discussions. It's important for us to be able to continue to do that work so we can have one interconnected and open internet. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. Boati? Yeah, fabulous to be in a room surrounded by people who are all very like-minded. I think we started by talking about the importance of multi-stakeholder partnerships, and I didn't see anybody shake their heads. It's also fabulous to be in a room where I can recognize my privilege, but also recognize the privilege of the whole audience in front of me, and to understand that we have two days, four days left to get together speak about potential opportunities as well as the challenges such as gender violence online and how to tackle them. And I hope that like me and my colleagues from Meta who are here, you will use your time uh, productively for the underprivileged. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Onika, you get the last word. Well, um, so gender exclusion is actually costing our countries a lot of money. In 2020, about a trillion dollars in GDP. So there is a real cost to the exclusion. So I would urge us that, despite the, apart from the fact that it is the right thing to do to make sure that we are mainstreaming gender in our ICT policies, it is also the cost-efficient thing to do to make sure that we build an inclusive digital economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on that note, this is where we wrap up. We bring this session to a close. I want to thank everyone for attending. A really special thanks to my team. I mean, it was an amazing panel discussion, especially our persons who were online. Thank you so much. We look forward now to the report from the rapporteur coming out and seeing how we can move forward on these initiatives and collaborations. I'm going to ask you to give us a big round of applause for our, for our panelists and ask our panelists and our online guests not to move as we're going to have our photo, photo op right here at the end. But thank you again, everyone.